Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Hines County in Mississippi, me and three of my friends were on County Line Road West between Watkins Drive and the Hanging Moss Road in Jackson, Mississippi. We were at a small pond just off the road, doing what you did back in the day, drinking a few beers. We had the radio going pretty much mellow for the day when my friend Tim, whose car we were in, said, Did you hear that? We turned the radio down and rolled the windows down a little and listened. There was nothing. So we turned the radio back up and in a few minutes, we did hear something. It was a pretty loud growl, not like anything I'd ever heard before. We were on the north side of the pond, and it was on the south side. There were cattails that were at least seven foot tall on that side of the pond. Tim turned on the headlights, and across the pond, there was a huge hairy ape with huge green eyes, and it was turning its head slightly from side to side and blinking its eyes, which were green only because of the headlights. Well, that got all of our attention real good. I remember asking everyone if they saw what I did, and we all agreed that Bigfoot was on the other side of this really small pond. It had to be at least eight feet tall and had a very cone-shaped head, just like a silverback gorilla, and was back as far as I could tell. It was making some grunting sounds every now and then. We cut the headlights off and cranked the car, which chose to take a very long time to fire up when the animal let out the most spine-tingling roar I've ever heard kind of like a lion's grunt, but much louder and longer. The car fired up and we got out of there. When the headlights came back on, it was still there. I have to say, it scared us so bad we didn't tell many people, but it has remained in my memory all these years. I can still hear the roar. I grew up in the woods since I was seven. I always felt like something was watching me. From bicycles to dirt bikes, we ride those trails. At the time of the sighting, the area was being developed into an industrial park and Highway 220 bypass was in its first stages. We really were on the edge of Jackson at the time. It was good big woods with streams and ponds here and there. Thanks for letting me tell this as I'll never be able to forget. I moved from Mississippi, and I never saw tracks or any sign of Bigfoot, although I did know about it. I did look for tracks pretty much whenever I was in the woods, which was very often. It was at nine at night, cloudy and still kind of warm. The area was big woods with small streams. Not many people back then. We were on an old farm that was being developed, a friend of ours, a year or two earlier, claimed to have been jumped from behind by a Bigfoot, no more than one mile east of there. We, of course, always said he was full of it. We found out different. We never saw the body below the upper shoulders, but this animal was very big, huge. On to the next one. In Clark County in Mississippi, my college roommate and I were driving home from a football game where we were playing in the marching band. The time was about 11 p.m. on a Saturday night. We were driving on Highway 512 through a community called Elwood in Clark County, Mississippi. As we approached the straight stretch, just before you reach the town of Quitman, we saw a creature walk from the bushes on the right side of the highway onto the road. 
It didn't see us or didn't look at us until it reached about the center line, then paused, looked at us, and then continued on across the road and into the woods on the other side. The creature was very tall with long arms. It had reddish brown fur all over. When it looked at us, its eyes reflected the headlights of our car. It walked upright with a pretty natural gait, almost fluid in its movement. We had been talking about the game on the way home, but when we saw whatever it was, we both stopped. I slowed down the car as I got to where it crossed, and I know the hair stood up on my arms. It still does today when I tell the story again. We knew we had witnessed something unusual that night. Just my roommate and I coming home from playing in the band at a JC football game. It was around 11 p.m. There was no rain, no fog, no moon that I can remember. There was only light from the car headlights between the Pine Forest and the Chickasaw River. On to the next one. in Pearl River County in Mississippi. My mother and I had taken my young Doberman to the Honey Island Swamp to let him run and get some exercise. We had driven to the end of the road where the bridge had collapsed and you could not go any further back by car. The area is a few miles from the Honey Island exit off Interstate 59 in Mississippi. The road was built up about eight feet from the ground since it had flooded back there. The area around the road was swampy and had a lot of trees. The ground was covered in leaves since it was fall. We had been there about 10 minutes and my dog had been pretty much just staying on the road as he ran around. I went to get something out of the car and when I started walking back to where my mother was on the road, she was looking out into the wooded area at something. She pointed out what appeared to be something dark beside a large cypress tree. We could not make out a head, but it appeared to be a gray or black fur covered torso. Whatever we were looking at was large because it stood above some bushes and the top part was behind the branches of the tree. It had to have been well over six feet tall since the bushes were at least three feet tall. It was definitely not another tree, because the texture was so different from the big tree it was next to. It was approximately 1 p.m., and the sun was bright. The light was dappled through the tree cover, but we could see that it was shining off what appeared to be hair or something with a hairy texture. It seemed to shift back and forth as if you were to shift your weight from one leg to another. It was probably 50 to 75 feet away from us, so we could not get a real good look at it. We did not hear or smell anything, and my dog did not seem to notice anything outside the ordinary. After looking at it for at least two to three minutes, we got very uncomfortable and decided that we would drive a mile or so up past one of the bridges on the way back to the interstate. We put my dog in the car and drove at least a mile up the road before we stopped again to let my dog back out. We had been there approximately five minutes when we heard footsteps in the woods. We could hear them getting closer. This time, my dog picked up on the sound and became alert. We could hear it stop and then move forward, but my dog was definitely trying to figure out what he was hearing. We got a little scared, so we loaded up again, and this time drove to where there are some nature trails and a shooting range, probably at least one and a half to two miles up the road. We got out of the car again, and were not there two minutes when we heard what sounded like something running through the woods towards us. At that point, my dog got so scared that he ran back to the car and hit the closed car door, trying to get back in. My mother and I ran to the car, and all three of us got out of there as fast as we could. We never saw what was making the noise in the woods. After leaving and having major discussions about what had happened, my mother and I got our nerve 
up to go back later that day at about 4 p.m. to see if what we had seen earlier was still there. When we got there, we could not find what we had seen there before. We saw what we are pretty sure was the big tree, but we didn't see what was by it originally. We were not brave enough to go down into the wooded area for a closer look. So we basically left with even more questions than we started out with. We never had a clear view of what we saw, but what we heard definitely scared us. It was just my mother and me. We were trying to get my dog to run around and get some exercise. It was approximately 1 p.m. and it was clear and sunny. It was a swampy wooded area by a creek. The ground was covered in leaves and vegetation. I once met a girl in Slidell that told me that her family used to camp in the Honey Island Swamp and that something came up one night around the campfire. She said that her dad and uncle scared it off by shooting in the air. On to the next one. While I was working as a paramedic in Anchorage, we got a call out on an alarm for a man having a heart attack in the state jail in Eagle River. He was a native man in his late 70s, and after I got him stabilized with IVs, oxygen, and cardiac drugs, my partner and I began to transport him to the native hospital in Anchorage. On route to the hospital, I had time to talk to this gentleman who was an alute from the native village of Port Graham a remote village on the lower end of Cook Island. Well, as usual with me, the topic eventually drifted to hunting and fishing, and I casually mentioned to him that I and two other hunting buddies were once weathered in an upper lagoon of Dogfish Bay, only a few miles from his home in Port Graham. The lagoon was about as beautiful and wild a place as I ever seen in my 35 years in Alaska. Well, when I say that I had spent some time in dogfish, this old man sat up on the gurney and grabbed me by the front of my shirt. He got right up to my face and said, did it bother you? Well, with that question, the hair stood up on the back of my head. I said, yes, did you see it? Was his next question. I said, no, did you see it? He said, no, but my brother seen it. It chased him. This old elute and I were talking about the same thing but we never used the word Bigfoot or legend or anything like that. But we both knew what we were talking about. You see, a few years back, three of us were bow hunting for goat and black bears in what was then the most remote wilderness of the lower Cook Inlet when a storm forced us to take shelter in Dogfish Bay Lagoon. We beached our skiff and let the tide run her dry. After a dinner of broiled salmon, we turned into our tent. Back in those days, the best tent I had was a dark green canvas tent with a center pole and no windows or floors. We left the fire burning and cleaned the pots and pans so as to not attract bears during the night and turned in. The sky was clear, but the wind was howling through the old growth timber that lined the shore. Sometime around 2 a.m., my friend Dennis woke me up by squeezing my leg. I could dimly see his face in his tent. His finger was across his lips. I listened. Then I heard it. A step. A man was quietly walking outside our tent, taking very deliberate steps. Not a bear. Scenes from the movie Deliverance flashed through my mind. We woke Joe, the third member of our party, with the same leg grab and finger to the lips. The walking, or rather sneaking, continued until it half-circled our tent, and then all was quiet except for the wind. We had our bows and the O6 leaning against a tree outside of the tent. So, somehow, we talked Joe into belly crawling out of the tent to get the rifle. We were scared senseless, I tell you. The next day and night, the storm continued to blow. We saw several black bears on the salmon stream at the head of the lagoon during the evening hunt, but had no chance for a shot. We didn't talk about what had happened last night. <laughs> Too embarrassed, I guess, to be scared by a black bear that sounded like a man. 
We got back to the camp early, built a big fire, sat around it, and ate dinner until around midnight. In August, there is still some daylight in the sky until about 10 or 11. I recall that we were embarrassed about being afraid about the coming night. We had a flashlight and a rifle in the tent between us, locked and loaded. I finally dozed off, but woke right up when Dennis squeezed my leg. The illuminated hands of my watch showed it was 2.30. Joe was already sitting up and had the rifle in hand. I heard the first step, not more than about 10 feet from the back of the tent. Slowly, then another and another. Whatever this was, it sounded like it was walking on two feet. It made the same semicircle around the tent. When we finally got enough courage to crawl out of the tent and turn the flashlight on, we saw nothing. No tracks, nothing. The third night, we decided if it bothered us again, we would come out of the tent shooting. We were actually scared. It never came back the third night. And the following day, we had a break in the weather and got the heck out of there. We never told anybody about the experience for several years until I happened to be reading an old Alaska sportsman magazine. In the letters to the editor, a woman wrote that she recently found a letter written by some distant relative of hers who was a school teacher in the cannery in Portlock Bay, a rugged fjord adjacent to Dogfish Bay. The year was 1905. She quoted from the letter, It is said that the cannery employed a small group of Aleut from a small village in Portlock Bay during salmon season. Their camp was about a mile from the cannery building. One day, all the Aleut moved out of the village and paddled their bydark back to Port Graham. The letter said that the Aleut claimed that the hairy man was bothering and frightening them to the point where they had to leave. I've since done some research into the subject and found written histories of natives from Seldova to Port Graham being frightened and bothered by something. They even have a native name for it. It doesn't translate into English very well. These accounts mostly take place during the first half of the 1900s and are mostly native related, but not all. I talked to one white guy who got the bejeeber scared out of him while coming down an alder choked gully while on a goat hunt in Portlock, Alaska. Most of these accounts came before the Bigfoot hype that began to appear in the 60s and 70s in Northwest and North California. Well, anyway, that's my story. On to the next one. Near Maple Valley in King County, Washington, it was evening and Tony McLennan was driving. He suddenly slowed up to avoid hitting an injured dog on the road. Then the dog stood up and was not a dog at all. It was a tall, hairy humanoid, an ape-like beast with long, swinging arms and glowing, not reflecting red eyes. It was eight feet tall. The police investigated and found a freshly made path through the thick brush, as well as four-inch-long strands of dark hair on nearby branches. On to the next one. Near Silverton in Snohomish County in Washington, right after Red Bridge is a road going to Black Chief Silver Mine. This road passes through some residential property and then ends with a berm. We went past the berm about five to ten miles on the Mountain Loop Highway. This has never been reported. Two teenagers were riding dirt bikes on an old overgrown logging road and stopped for a cigarette at a small lake or beaver pond. They were there for just a couple of minutes, around three to four, when a loud, blood-curdling scream was heard coming from an opposite ridge about a mile away, no more than two. The scream lasted at most 15 seconds and varied in pitch and tone throughout its length. It made the hairs on the back of their necks stand up. There were no roads on the opposite ridge. They immediately got back on their bikes and left only telling immediate family members about the scream they heard. 
No other people or ground marks indicating recent human activity were seen. Many years later, while watching a Sasquatch documentary, the same sound was recognized. It was said to be an actual recording of a Sasquatch from Southern Oregon or Northern California. There were two witnesses, Dave Monzel at the time was 14 and Dave Reef was 15 or 16, riding dirt bikes and then resting and having a cigarette. Dave Monzel is now an aerospace engineer in Maryland. It was 2 p.m. and partly cloudy, heavily forested. The logging road had small alders growing throughout it. On to the next one. This was near Granite Falls in Snohomish County in Washington. I and my three friends, Tom, Byron, and Jay, went camping with their parents who slept inside their camper while we slept on the ground with a plastic tarp draped over us. It had been raining the day before. Around 2 a.m., I was awakened by an eerie screaming. It sounded like a woman was being murdered. It freaked me out. The screaming was across the still Agamish River, which was about 50 meters from where we slept, and into the forest on the other side. Across the river was a steep incline into the rustic forest and beyond that was nothing but wilderness, all the way into Canada. The screaming became louder and louder as the thing that was screaming was getting closer. I heard it walking down the steep hill on the other side of the river, and then I heard it walk up and down the other side of the river, screaming all the more. It was very loud and very scary. It gave me the impression that it was angry, angry at us for being in its area and wanting us out. That was my impression. I was scared to death, and I did not know what to do. Then, suddenly, the thing walked across the river towards me. It came to my side of the river and began to walk up and down the riverbank, screaming all the louder. Then, it stepped on a fallen tree that was on the riverbank, and I heard a snap as the weight of the thing broke the log as it stepped on it. Then, the thing walked up to me and my friends, and came within 10 feet of us and screamed some more. I thought it was going to kill us. Just then, I noticed the terrible odor that this thing had. It was overwhelming. It was so strong, it made my eyes water. I was petrified. I was too scared to even move, to speak, to do anything. I really thought it was going to kill me. It was lasting forever. This thing was standing over the top of me, screaming, smelling horrible, and scaring me to death. Then he started to simply walk away. It went back to the river and walked across it to the other side. Then it climbed up the steep hill and into the forest, screaming all the time. The screams became further and further away. When it was a good distance away, I started to believe that it wasn't going to kill me. Then I asked my friends, Tom, Byron, Jay, did you guys hear that? They all three jumped up and yelled at me. Yes, what the heck was that? It seemed they were just as terrified as I was and were frozen stiff with fear. The entire episode lasted for approximately 25 minutes. What did I see? I saw nothing because it was pitch black dark. I heard and smelled everything. It was as real as it could possibly have been, and we are convinced that it was some kind of monster. It walked on two legs, just like a human. I have been shot at, artillery shelled, sniper shot at, have had a hand grenade tossed at me, survived an ambush and IEDs while in combat. I have been attacked by a 12-foot shark while scuba diving. I have been face-to-face -face with three adult man-eating lions that were the pets of Saddam Hussein's son. Nothing can compare with the feeling that I felt this day. It lasted so long. I have never heard of anyone having an exposure to Bigfoot as long as this was. The odor was overpowering. It made my eyes water. It was so strong. This thing was less than 10 feet from me. The other witnesses were all asleep when it started, 
and witnessed the entire episode with me. It was around 2 a.m. It was thick evergreen forested area with the south fork of the Stillagamish River by it. My brother saw Bigfoot about a year later in the same area. There were many sightings in that area of Granite Falls. On to the next one. Seattle Times, Bigfoot Leaves a Trail, Cougar, Cowlitz County. During the summer, loggers in Lewis River Basin said they heard strange chirping and whistling noises. Twice, the Night Fire Watch reported hearing cattle nearby leap to their feet in the middle of the night and crash off through the brush. In July, a boatyard owner said he saw a Sasquatch near one of the boats. And in August, a logger's wife said she saw the legendary Bigfoot of the Pacific Northwest cross a road. Now, the leader of a group of scientists who spent the summer searching for a Sasquatch near the Cowlitz County logging community has studied a sequence of 161 large man-like tracks found by loggers on October 7th. It's the longest string of tracks ever examined by scientists, to my knowledge, said Robert W. Morgan, head of the American Yeti Expedition. He said the footprints were 18 inches long, 7 inches across at the ball of the foot, and 5.5 and inches across at the heel, with an average stride of more than 50 inches. It is overwhelmingly probable that they are real, said Grover Krantz, a physical anthropologist from Washington State University. I've seen some pretty sophisticated fakes, Krantz said. I don't think these could have been done with fake feet. Krantz estimated that the creature that made the footprint stood more than eight feet tall and weighed about 800 pounds. On to the next one. In King County in Washington, it happened so long ago, it seems surreal to me, but I saw Bigfoot with my friends. I lived on a piece of property that had four houses on about 20 acres. I was nine at the time, and so was my friend. There were eight to nine ponds with a creek connecting them. They were small ponds, average size, probably 20 by 30 feet. There was a field on one side of the upper pond and a hillside on the other one with dense fir trees of various sizes. It was a fall day, probably October, and around 4 p.m., and it was kind of dark and cloudy with a medium rainfall. From the start of one pond to the end of the last pond, it was probably 150 to 200 yards. My house was about 100 to 150 yards from the sighting. My friend and I were catching crawdads in the ponds, we had probably been out there for a couple of hours when it happened. I was close to the pond on the field side, and my friend was behind me about 10 or 15 feet on the field side. I looked up the hillside 20 feet up, and 40 to 50 yards away, where I saw a creature 8 feet tall, walking upright at an angle, going up the hillside. The hillside was about 125 feet tall. It was big. I yelled at my friend, and it turned and looked at us. My friend did not know what I was yelling about. I started to run toward my house. I ran right by my friend yelling. He then saw it and started running behind me. I was terribly scared, as was my friend. I only saw it for about five or ten seconds, but I know what I saw. It was big and walking upright. It looked like the Bigfoot from the Patterson-Gimlin film, honestly. I recall it being black or dark brown with short to medium hair. I talked to my friend a couple of years later and we talked about the incident and he agreed with me about what happened. I have not talked to him for 20 years plus about it. We live in different places now and a lot has changed, but we know what we both saw and without a doubt, it was a Bigfoot. It was 4 p.m. on a rainy, dark, cloudy day. It was in an area of big fir trees, a small creek with many ponds, and an open field, and a large hillside. On to the next one. Near Whitehorse Mountain, near Darrington, in Snohomish County in Washington, two boys came home to their mother and were crying because their feet were cold and wet from walking barefoot in the snow. When asked why they did that, 
They replied that all the other boys were doing it also because they saw footprints in the snow first. The mother went to see for herself and found 19-inch human-like tracks in two feet of snow. Photographs were taken of the impressions. Kids were riding bikes on a dirt road with snow on it. On to the next one. In July of 1984, a group of about 20 people and the two of us had planned to head into the Shasta National Forest and hike up to Dead Falls Lake for a little overnighter with guitars and beer. If you've never been there, Mount Eddy Lake and Dead Falls Lake fit in what I would call a bowl surrounded by mountain peaks. There isn't much of a shoreline to speak of. Instead, the surrounding hills and trees abruptly meet the edge of the water. It is a fantastic and desolate spot, and it's a great destination for those who want to hike in and crash on a blanket once you can't stay awake any longer. We began the night's festivities, and it was turning out to be a pretty good night. We had some campfire sing-alongs, some hot dogs, and quite a lot of beer. We first noticed the blue lights at about 2 a.m. This light was emanating from thousands of feet up, glowing over one of the northern peaks. Considering that there isn't anything out here in this hour of the night aside from people like us, it was a bizarre sight. Needless to say, it had all of our attention. Some of us sat and others stood as we watched the blue light grow in intensity. It seemed as though the unknown source of light was about to come over the peak. About 10 minutes later, there it was. It was miles away, but we could now make out a large glowing disc extruding what appeared to be a combination of extremely bright blue and white light. From a distance, it almost appeared like the disc was alive. I know this is really weird, but you will know why I mention it in a minute. If it hadn't had our attention before, it clearly had our attention now. It slowly made its way over the peak and was gradually making its way down into the valley in which we were gathered. As it began its descent, beams of light started to emanate from different sides of the object. They moved from one side to the other, flashing on and off as it appeared to be scouring the terrain. Some members of the group were already getting angsty and afraid, especially the girls, but there was nowhere to run and hide especially since the searchlights were so bright. It was getting closer and closer to our position. We realized that whatever it was could certainly see our blazing fire, so some of us started to throw dirt on the flames and squirting them with beer. Others filled empty bottles with water from the lake in order to extinguish it. It was difficult to gauge the distance and size of the object, but it was slowly coming towards the lake and the entire landscape was glowing beneath it. All of us could now see that the craft was organic. Now it was glowing with a yellowish-white color, but bright blue still swirled around its base, which appeared like pigment being mixed into a can of fresh paint. It was beyond my wildest imagination. Another ten minutes passed when half of the group said they were getting the heck out of there, and the rest of us stayed. In movies, the people who run always get attacked, and I wasn't planning on being one of them. This craft had now reached the other end of the lake, which was still a considerable distance away from us. By this time, I could now see this disc was at least 200 feet across, when all of a sudden it stopped and began to pulse, growing brighter and then dimmer like a heartbeat. All of the searchlights had stopped moving, and a ring of fuzzy, multicolored lights started to circle its outer edge. They were red, green, and yellow, and they weren't sharp beams like the searchlight. Our fire was completely out now, and we were standing in the pitch dark, totally awed by what we were seeing, as the thing hovered over this one spot for almost 20 minutes. Suddenly, a wide column of powder blue light flashed from its base to the ground below us as the craft continued to pulse. From our vantage point, it was little more than a speck, but... There was something being drawn up from the ground within the tube of light. The thing stopped about midway between the ground and the craft, literally suspended in midair within the light. 
Everything stayed still for another 10 or 15 minutes, but then several other specks started to descend from the craft's base. These specks were much smaller than the first. Again, from the distance we were, there was no way of telling what any of these things were. The descending specks stopped in the middle of the tube right where the first thing was. After another half an hour of stillness, the specks that had descended from the craft were drawn back upward and vanished from our sight. However, the other one remained suspended in the middle of the tube of light. Suddenly, the craft stopped pulsing and began to glow brightly again, illuminating the entire lake area and the countryside below, and then it started to move. It glided slowly and silently over the lake, heading directly for us. Not a word was spoken among those who remained. We were awestruck and silent, staring in utter amazement. It was only a football field away and coming closer. And I could now see that this was a glowing structure. It was definitely a large disc, but it had to be 400 feet wide, not the 200 feet that I had originally thought. It was enormous. The shaft of blue light remained totally intact and unmoving, as the ship moved over the lake. The water started to grow choppy, just like it would on a windy day. However, it was only choppy within the confines of where the light contacted the lake's surface. Everything around the perimeter was still calm. The light was drawing on and disturbing the water as it passed over it. Now I could see, beyond the shadow of doubt, that the speck that had been lifted from the earth and into the tube of light was a gigantic Bigfoot. It looked like it was in a state of suspended animation, being held in the light some 75 feet off the lake surface. It didn't move an inch and was completely aglow in the soft blue light. The saucer passed just to our east and we all turned like automatons, watching it move away. Suddenly, there was a bright flash of light and it was all over. The disc was totally and completely gone. It had not flown away at a high rate of speed. It had vanished. We all stood in a daze for a few minutes, almost as if we had been taken over by some type of mystic force while these events had unfolded. Seeing the Bigfoot motionless within the tube of light was unbelievable to say the least, and what the connection was between it and the craft is still unknown to all of us. We simply saw what we saw. To stand in the open country and watch this silent, massive glowing disc move across the landscape was intimidating. I mean, we all know jets, prop planes, ultralights, and rockets, but to behold something 400 feet in diameter moving at a snail's pace and hovering motionless while not so much as making a sound was mind-blowing. It had to run on some sort of inexhaustible energy source. The lights were so bright and they never stopped pulsing and glowing. I mean, think about it. When we fly on a jetliner, there are the cabin lights and a few lights on the fuselage of the jet. This entire craft was in light, and it contained numerous other tremendously powerful lights within it as well. The entire skin of this thing was moving, or at least, that's the way it appeared to our eyes. It was like liquid contained within some type of casing moving plasma, shifting and melting and swirling together. On to the next one. My name is Josh, and I'm lucky to say I survived a terrifying experience with the elusive Bigfoot creatures. For those of you who believe they are soft and cuddly, like hairy, fun, but ridiculous movie, I'm sorry to break it to you. That's the furthest thing from the case. My buddy and I were up in the Lake Tahoe area on the California side, visiting his girlfriend that he met at college. Her family was really into skiing, so they invited us and a few others to stay there for a couple of days during the winter break. I think we were there for about four days in total. They owned a couple of snowmobiles, and it was on the final morning that we were there that we decided to take them for a spin. There were a few good trails that were accessible from their home, so all we had to do was ride them straight out of the garage, and we'd eventually make our way to one of the paths. I remember how the path we took 
had a steep incline as we rode up into the woods. I had never been on a snowmobile before, and it was a ton of fun. I kept thinking about how badly I wanted to get one. My buddy and his girlfriend were on the other snowmobile, and I was following closely behind. We had a blast carving around trees and racing down slopes. I remember thinking it felt like I was riding a rocket through a winter wonderland. Such an awesome experience, but the positive vibes of that day would soon do a 180. I have no idea how far into the woods we were, but we eventually made it to a lookout that provided one of the most stunning views I had ever seen. The three of us had gotten off our rides and walked around the area, checking out various angles of the view. That was when my buddy revealed that he had three naturally chilled cans of beer in the backpack he had brought with him. My buddy and I were chugging the beers when his girlfriend ran over and wrapped her arm around him. She was scared and told us she thought she saw someone peek its head out to look at us from behind the trees, and they had a really weird face. When she pointed toward the area where she claimed to see this person, there was nothing there but snow-covered pine trees. My buddy started laughing and giving her crap, insisting that she had imagined it and that she belonged in a big city because nature was too scary for her. Still, she insisted she saw someone, and my buddy walked over to the area near the trees with intent to prove her wrong. It was as he was about three-quarters of the way over to the area that the Bigfoot stepped out into the open and hissed at him. Its hair was mostly black, but it had a little bit of white beneath its chin. I've heard time and time again that the heads on these things are conical, but what we saw had a round head and round face. I should also mention that the face was very light, almost cream-colored. Its eyes were so wide and black. I also noticed small, cream-colored ears poking out the sides of its head. I understand what people mean when they say these things don't look like a man or an ape. It's like they belong in their entirely own category. But I think many people tend to place them in the ape category because of how muscular they are and because they frequently walk on two feet. I can't think of anything else that has defined muscles so densely packed into it. It was like a hairy version of the Incredible Hulk. It startled my buddy so badly that he fell on his butt. He frantically rose to his feet and ran towards us. Without further hesitation, the three of us ran over to the snowmobiles and revved them up. It was slower to get mine started because I wasn't the one to switch it on the first time around. I guess my adrenaline served me well, and fortunately, I was able to figure it out on the fly, with my friend leading the way. I tailgated him while I did my best to keep my attention forward. The first time I glanced over my shoulder, I was terrified to see that the strange animal was chasing us on all fours. It reminded me of a very large dog charging through the snow as the fresh white powder was kicked up behind it. The second time I glanced over my shoulder, I nearly veered off course due to the sight. At least three more of the animals had joined the chase. I had trouble counting exactly how many there were because they blended in with the bark on the trees as well as the various boulders that were fully coated with snow. Their jaws were hanging open, revealing how large their mouths were. I completely get what people mean when they mention that aspect. As they chased after us, they made lots of monkey-like noises hooting and hollering and seemingly communicating with one another. They were so agile atop the natural terrain, and you could tell that years and years of evolution that helped them to adapt perfectly to the environment. The whole thing was happening so fast that it was as if I didn't even have time to acknowledge 
how scared I was. Once your adrenaline gets going, it's amazing how efficient the brain can be under maximum pressure. Looking back on it, it's comforting to know that we can rely on our instincts when in do or die situations. Even above the noise of the snowmobiles, the animals and the wind, I could hear my buddy's girlfriend crying and hyperventilating from how afraid she was. Eventually, I noticed that we started to create more space between our vehicle and the rare animals. I definitely think it helped that we were heading downhill for most of the way back to the cabin. Suddenly, I felt something whistle past my right ear. It was a small stone. Unfortunately, it hit the girl near the middle of her back and she screamed out of agony. Out of fear that more stones were on their way, I ducked my head and kept it there for the remainder of the ride. The next time I looked over my shoulder, we were no longer being followed. They're gone, I yelled, mainly trying to help the girl calm down a bit. They're gone. She was so emotional that I was worried it was going to damage her heart. I remember how relieved I was the very second that I laid eyes on the house. Once we parked the snowmobile, my friend helped his girlfriend onto her feet. It was quite a while before she was able to speak. I can't say what it was, and I'm probably better off not knowing, but I later found a rather large glob of yellowish gooey substance spattered across the back of my jacket. It looked disgusting and smelled god-awful. You might be surprised to learn this, but I was actually very grateful for having experienced that incident from hell. Surviving it made me appreciate life in a way that I had never before. I even mended my relationship with a family member that was damaged a couple of years beforehand. But aside from that, it made me feel as though I had gained entry into a community. The community of Bigfoot believers. I'm certain that many would agree there is a satisfying feeling from being one of the few who knows the truth that these things are out there. I've even made some close friends after attending a few conventions. That encounter paved the way to so many new experiences, and I'll forever appreciate that. Sometimes a little bit of fear can do some good. Stay safe out there, friends. On to the next one. My name is Sarah, and a Sasquatch visited me in Chelan, Washington when I was 16, babysitting one of the little boys who lived down the street from me. I was one of those kids who was pretty darn good at convincing adults that I was a goody two-shoes. However, when I was with my friends or behind closed doors, I was a different story. I was really into emo, metal, and punk rock at the time, and luckily, the little boy Avery was very well behaved. All I would have to do was cook him a microwave meal, and he would spend the rest of the night in front of the Xbox or PlayStation or whatever. That allowed me to go off and do whatever I wanted. I would almost always have a friend or two over, and I don't think Avery ever even noticed. So, there was this one night where I was hanging out with one of my girlfriends, and when I got up to put another CD in the player, I heard what sounded like a wooden instrument being played somewhere outside. Whatever it was, it sounded like only a human could have done it. So, my first thought was that Avery had gone outside to play. I think he was only seven years old, so I didn't want him to be wandering around in the dark. I knew there were dangerous animals out there, like bears and cougars. The last thing I wanted was for the kid's parents to find out that he had wandered off into the nearby mountains or something. I can remember my friend Courtney insisting that it was probably a woodpecker, but I knew that the noise was too advanced for a small bird. I didn't know what to think, but I needed to double check that Avery wasn't out there. When I went to check on Avery, he wasn't in his usual spot on the floor in front of the TV. 
I started to panic a bit, concluding that he had ventured outside. After I opened the door to the back patio, I started calling his name. It was then that I heard the same knocking noise from before, only this time it was much louder since I was outside. It sounded so much like an exotic drum, like it could be coming from tribespeople. Naturally, that creeped me out. Since the house was so close to the middle of nowhere, it was soon after I heard the noise that I heard Avery responding to my calls, only his voice was coming from inside the house. Of course, I was relieved to learn that he hadn't gone out there, but I think part of me wished it was him that was responsible for the noise, because who else could it be? It was as I was closing the door and turning off the back patio light that I saw something run across the back lawn on all fours. I thought it was a person, because that's what the shape resembled most. It was as I was peering through the glass, trying to see anything else that Courtney approached my side and informed me that Avery seemed extremely frightened by something. She said that he refused to come out from under his bed. When I entered his bedroom and leaned my head under the bed frame, I quickly noticed his voice was very shaky. When I asked him what he saw, he told me that there's a monster that comes around whenever his parents aren't home. Normally, I would have thought nothing of the kid's words, but hearing the noise and then seeing a large figure run across the lawn made me question otherwise. When I asked Avery if he's told his parents of this monster, he told me what I expected to hear, that they never believe him. I had babysat for him a few times in the past, and nothing like that had ever happened. Avery then informed me that there was another babysitter that got so scared after seeing the monster that he called Avery's parents and asked them to come home because he refused to be there any longer. Apparently, they concluded that he must have seen a large bear and mistook it for something else. It was as I finally got him to start crawling out from under the bed that we all heard that same drumming noise again. That caused Avery to flee back under the bed frame, and he then started to cry. Is it that monster that makes that noise? I asked him. He nodded his head. How can you be sure? I asked. Because it always comes to look at me after it makes that noise, Avery said, clearly very worried by his own words. Suddenly, I had this horrible feeling that I can't explain. It was something other than the paranoia. It was a fear that came deep from within my gut. I looked up at Courtney at that moment, quick to realize that she was wide-eyed and paralyzed with fear, staring across the bedroom at one of the windows. When I shifted my gaze in the same direction, I instantly felt a knot in my chest. A face, one that looked like a very ugly man, peered through the glass. Only about half of its face was visible, as the other half was hidden behind the outer wall of the house. The skin was a pale gray color, and the lips appeared to be extremely chapped with sizable lacerations. Also, it seemed to be balding as only little blotches of hair were near the front of its head. I was too afraid to scream. And I doubt that I could have even if I wanted to. It was like my lungs were paralyzed from being so freaked out. I've heard a lot of people claim that these things are friendly, but I felt no such thing from this creature. I know this will probably sound crazy, but I couldn't help feel as though it was plotting something. Don't ask me why I felt that. I just did. You could see intention within the way it stared into the room. I'm calling the police, Courtney said as she walked out of the room. When the creature disappeared a few moments later, I began to regain a bit of composure and could hear her speaking to the emergency dispatch over the phone. Even though I didn't prefer the cops to come by, it seemed that any alternative was superior to the three of us being stuck here with that creature roaming around the yard. She began to stutter once the operator asked her what the intruder looked like. Look, 
Can you just send someone over? She said, growing more anxious by the second. It was then that the tapping against the window caused Courtney to drop the phone. And Avery started crying louder than before. I didn't look toward the window at the time. Instead, I pulled Avery out from under the bed and essentially dragged him into the hallway. Courtney quickly joined us, and that was when she told us about the size of the finger that we could still hear tapping on the glass. She also said that the hand was massive, and there was no way it could have been any human that stood outside that bedroom. Allegedly, she had seen the entire face, and it was at least three times the size of any man's head. I had to ask her to hush because I could tell Avery was undergoing a state of shock. Sure, he had seen the creature multiple times before that point, but I believe it was the confirmation that someone else was seeing it too that elevated his fear to another level. Up until then, he had been told that the visitor was imaginary, so I suspect part of him started to believe that. Eventually, the tapping noise stopped, and it wasn't much longer before we heard the doorbell ring. If it wasn't for a man shouting the word police, I wouldn't have been so sure that the creature wasn't the one activating the doorbell. After Courtney and Avery went over to sit on the couch, I answered the door. One male officer was at the door, and the female officer was pointing a flashlight toward the woods. Her body language suggested that she might have spotted something. But it wasn't long before she turned around and joined the other officer's side. I explained to them everything that we saw, and I quickly realized how goofy all of it sounded when I tried to put it into words. I could tell both the policemen were already wondering whether I was under the influence of something and if it had caused me to imagine the whole scenario. They didn't seem like they were very concerned by the potentiality that the situation was true. Instead, it seemed as though they were far more concerned whether Avery was under responsible supervision. I helplessly watched as the female officer took Avery to the side and began to ask him a series of questions. They were far enough away that I couldn't hear their conversation. The male officer then asked Courtney and I to step out onto the front porch so that he could ask us a few things. Unsurprisingly, the first thing he did was shine the flashlight into our eyes. When he asked us whether we had anything to drink, that's when I started to lose my patience. I had no interest in being outside at that moment, even under the watch of an armed police officer. There was something about the creature's face that made me feel like we wouldn't be safe, even with five police officers. All I wanted was for him to take what we were saying seriously. But I suddenly felt like a child, one that was trying to be persuaded into believing that she had just cried wolf. It was infuriating. Something about that made me hysterical, and I found myself arguing with the officer while crying at the same time. So many emotions were going through my head, I wanted to feel safe while simultaneously trying to come with terms with the fact that Bigfoot is real. I was a bit irritated with Courtney because she wasn't saying a whole lot to back me up. But looking back on it, I sympathize with her because I think she also entered a state of shock. You can't expect anyone to function when they're feeling that way. It got to the point where the female officer called Avery's parents to inform them of the situation. When they arrived home, I felt so bad and desperately tried to convince them of what happened, but they wouldn't have it. They never hired me to babysit for them again. A few weeks later, I found out that the family moved out of the area, but nobody knows why. I have a pretty good hunch. On to the next one. I live on a river in southwest Missouri. My buddy and I decided to go night fishing one summer night. We paddled upriver in a canoe. It was a very quiet, still night. Pitch black, no moon. All of a sudden, we heard a big splash about 20 yards from us. 
We thought it was weird, but shrugged it off and kept fishing. Then another one came and splashed not much further than the first one. It seemed to follow us up the river, four to five splashes before we turned around and headed back. We do have beaver on the river, and I'm familiar with their tail slap alert. This was not that. It sounded like a good-sized rock hitting the water. You could hear the punch of the water, the splash going up, and then raining back down. My buddy thought it was someone following us up on the hillside throwing rocks at us. I knew that couldn't be it because of the time of night and the fact that there is nothing up there but a few hundred acres of wood. And I also heard no footsteps. Whatever was chucking rocks at them had to have been pretty far up the hillside. So a few years go by. That night was weird enough that I always remembered it. I was watching Paranormal Witness on TV, where a grandpa and grandson went camping and they claimed a Bigfoot started throwing rocks at them while they were fishing. That was where I made the connection. I never believed in the stuff till then and it really sparked my interest. I think the biggest evidence that makes me a believer is not my experience, but the fact that all eyewitnesses tell pretty much the same story. On to the next one. Being a man of good conscience and in fear of the Lord God Almighty, I've taken the liberty to set right in pen and paper the events and happenings which led to the demise of the wild man by my own hand in California on that July day. I'd been in Sacramento for the second time, taking care of some business and refreshing myself and my animal. After several weeks, I decided that a man could die here more easily than he could alone in the woods especially a man who is hunting for gold. So I packed my horse and mule and headed out once more. I had enough provisions for 16 weeks or so without taking into account what I would kill and eat. My carbine and sidearm were with me, as well as a large blade that I had won in a game of stud. After washing many a dead pan on my previous trip, I had come upon some color in the North Country. It was the most color in my pan that I had ever seen. At the time of the discovery, however, I had been running low on provisions. So I came back to Sacramento to resupply before heading back up north in the hopes of locating the origins of what I had panned and staking a claim to it. It was a steady 11-day ride to where I had found color and I had no idea how much further it would take to find the load if indeed one was to be found at all. The Lord was good to me and the weather was grand. Having two good animals that were strong and able to take the journey at hand, it was on the 11th day that I reached the tributary that had offered up gold on my last adventure, and I started panning to confirm my whereabouts. My first six pans yielded enough gold to pay a man three full months of wages, and having confirmed my find, I spent the night in some contentment. The following morning, I packed up my bedroll and headed north for a day's ride. It was there that I came upon a choke point in the water's flow where I stopped to make camp. Since three days outside of Sacramento, I hadn't run across another living soul. In the following 19 days, I panned enough gold to live out the rest of my days in luxury. I even handpicked some nuggets that were as big as my horse's teeth. One evening, I sat on a hillside in the hope of shooting some food, which I did. I came back to camp and made a little smoker out of boughs and branches and commenced to lay out the slabs for smoking by draping them over the wood. Since I stoked the fire through the night, my meat was prepared by morning. 
I had hard tack, flour, and some grits tucked into my saddlebag. And I now had an ample supply of smoked meat as well. I was not going to get greedy, knowing that it's not enough to find gold in this country, but one must also return alive to make good use of it. This land is littered with the bones of dead men who were murdered by the cold-blooded hands of those who relieved them of their fines. The next night, I slept well, with my carbine always loaded and at the ready next to me. During the night, I was awakened by my horse's snort and a whinny as I leapt to my feet with my gun. As I tried to get my bearings, looking toward the animals over the fire's glow, and I thought I saw something run away into the woods. However, since I was half asleep, and it was very dark, I was uncertain of the shadow, so I calmed the animals and sat by the fire for the rest of the night. I was uneasy. It wasn't until I was caring for the animals at sunup that, while reaching into my saddlebag, I realized that something had taken most of my smoked meat during the night. I must not have imagined something fleeing the scene that night, and I now knew that I wasn't alone here in these parts. In a single rifle shot could be the death of me in an instant. So, I determined to pack up and start heading back to stake my claim. Having secured my gear and mounted up, I headed out. I was working my way back down through a small grouping of trees when I heard something running to my right side. So I withdrew my carbine from its scabbard and held it at the ready. Perhaps a mere ten minutes after I had withdrawn my rifle, a hideous scream came bellowing out from within the trees, and my horse bucked sending me and my rifle butt over tea kettle into the ground. During my fall, a second scream sounded, and from my rather precarious position lying on the ground, I suddenly saw a wild man of a beast charging at me from some 100 feet away. My rifle had fallen right next to me, and I grabbed it. The beast was running at a rate that is not humanly possible, and it had maybe 30 feet before it would prevail upon me. So, I squeezed the trigger. It stopped in its tracks with a monstrous shriek as I chambered another round and shot it yet again. Still, it did not fall. It stood, groaning and staggering before I finished it off with a third salvo, as the beast finally fell to the ground, lifeless. I laid holding of a long branch, and, stepping close to the creature, I poked it. Its chest was not moving, and its smell was horrific, like that of decaying meat. I took a few moments to compose myself and retrieve the animal that had bolted. Thankfully, the mule was tethered to the horse, so they had not gone far away. When I returned, I stood there, pondering the beast and the events that had unfolded. I was thankful that it had not killed me while I slept. With its enormous proportions, it could have easily dispatched me. I then realized that I must have drawn it into camp with the smoking of the meat, for it was the very same smell that must have directed it right into the saddlebag which had contained it. Perhaps it had thought that it would stop me from leaving and have its fill of the rest. I could not believe what my eyes beheld. The hairy man's height was some seven feet or so, and its mouth was open wide as blood trickled down its jaw. The exposed teeth were like those that could be found in the mouth of my mule, yellow and cracked with age. It must have been the weight of a large grizzly with its palms being blackened and grayish in color, cracked and worn like an old pair of chaps. Its fingers were the length of a large cigar and hair covered its entire body. Though it lacked any real density, 
It seemed more like the hair that covers a man's head. The beast's feet were at least two or three times the size of my own, and its hands made mine look like those of a raccoon in comparison. I said a prayer for the beast and began to dig a shallow grave. I had to lash a rope to both the beast and my mule to drag it into the hole, and then I covered it over. I felt a certain guilt after having killed the creature. If it was a man, I would have confessed to it, and rightly so. But it was not a man. However, it was not really an animal either. So it was with a heavy heart that I felt the need to pen this testimony as my personal confession to God and man. On to the next one. The original homeland of the Modoc was mostly in the extreme northeastern corner of Northern California, right next to the Oregon border. The Modoc were made to live on reservations with other tribes, the Klamath being one such tribe, after being defeated by the U.S. Army during the Modoc War of 1872 to 1873. They were then forced to live on reservation areas in southern Oregon. Today, these reservation areas are located very near Klamath Falls and Chiloquin, Oregon. A man who wrote a story in the fall edition of the 1968 Many Smokes National American Indian Magazine retells the story of his grandfather and his encounter with what was called a people he referred to as Matakagmi. The first story of the Matakagmi related from the article took place in the summer of 1897. The first encounter had occurred near the reaches of Tool Lake, right next to the Oregon border. In the first encounter, the man's grandfather had spotted what had appeared to be a bush on the side of a deer trail in which he was also traveling. As he approached nearer, he became aware of a strong odor, sort of musky. Upon taking a closer look, he had realized that this was not a bush. No, according to the article, it was covered from head to foot with thick, coarse hair, much like horse hair. As the man stepped even closer, the creature made a strange noise. It was at this point in the story that the man had come to the realization that this was the man of the mountain the old one spoke about, a Sasquatch. It began to get dark out, and the man showed a gesture of friendship to the Sasquatch by laying down a string of fish he had just caught. Not a bad idea. The creature had apparently understood this to be a kind gesture and took the string of fish as it ran off into the surrounding forest. The Matakagmi then made a non-threatening, long, low sort of growl. A few weeks after this encounter, the man was awoken in his cabin by strange sounds. As he stepped outside his cabin, he found what the story describes, a stack of deer skins, fresh and ready for tanning. He again heard the same sort of a low sound he had heard only a few weeks ago. When he had given the creature a string of fish, it apparently had come to pay him back, and there were also other items left on the man's property from then on. Such items included, as is noted from the story, wood for fuel, acorn, wild berries, and fruit. A few years later, this man would also have another encounter with the Matakagmi. When helping some prospectors find gold on Mount Shasta, at the foot of Mount Shasta, where they were camped, as the other prospectors were drinking heavily, the Modoc man had left to explore some rock shelves further up a mountain trail. As he was climbing further up the rock shelves, he had encountered a timber rattler, which had struck him in the leg. After killing the rattlesnake and making his way down to the trail, he became sick to his stomach and passed out, according to the story. As he awoke, he thought he was dreaming for three large magtakagmi about eight to ten feet tall surrounded him. He noted that they had made a small cut on the snake bite and had somehow removed some of the venom and they placed cool moss on the bite. 
Two of the creatures had then carried the man down a trail which he was unfamiliar with and placed him further down the mountainside under a low, brushy tree before they left. He again heard their mournful cry as they had departed. The man then fired his gun into the air, and the other prospectors came and found him. He didn't mention the mad Kakagmi or how they had saved his life to any of the other prospectors. He only told the story to immediate family members. According to the story, he would sometimes say, Mad Kakagmi live, that holy place, I have friends there. Throughout the years thereafter, the man would sometimes still hear the soft, low cry of his friends, the Mad Kakagmi. I think this man's story is a great example of someone who actually had a subtle friendship with the creatures you and I know today as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. In another book written in 1912 by Jeremiah Curtin titled Myths of the Modak, are additional reconfirmed Native American details to a creature that seems to be described similarly to what we know today as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. In the book, the creatures are referred to as Yayahas by the Modoc tribe. This name is very similar to the Kalmath tribe's name Yayaya Ash. This name was probably incorporated among the Modoc sometime after having been relocated to the Klamath Reservation to live among the Klamath tribe in southern Oregon. In this book, Yayahas described as having the ability of walking slowly and quietly to avoid detection but is still quite swift. When he sees anyone, he walks slowly, but he can go around and come up in front of a person. He can disappear like a flash. According to the story in the book, Yaya Haas is described as being very big and powerful. He also kills five brothers as he throws them off a cliff. The notion that Bigfoot or Sasquatch may throw people off a cliff is also a much similar suggestion shared among quite a few other tribes as well, which are very spread out from one another. More specifically, the Modocs have suggested that the same described deity oftentimes throws people off of cliffs while they are hunting for mountain goats. The Paiute and Yakima tribes have similar stories to this effect as well, with suggestions that some described deity would also sometimes throw people off a cliff as they too were hunting or competing for goats or sheep while in the same mountain. In the story, when the monster is finally defeated and banished, he is told, you will always be on the mountains and by the water. You will walk around by the lakes and rivers, but you will never be a person again. The observations of something not quite human is still often made by many eyewitnesses while in mountain country today especially in area where water sources are abundant, such as lakes and rivers. Bigfoot or Sasquatch activity took place in 2012-13 to 13, near the Blue Mountains on the Umatilla Indian Reservation located east of Pendleton on the very northern tip of eastern Oregon. From a Monday, January 21, 2013 Oregonian newspaper title articled, does Bigfoot Prowl the Swamp by Richard Cockle are some fairly recent observations of the creature called Bigfoot among the Umatilla, Cayuse, and Walla Walla tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation east of Pendleton, Oregon. The story starts with some tribal observations of strange sounds heard outside of the reservation area, as is noted from the article. Some members of the Confederate Umatilla, Walla Walla, and Cayuse tribes say the noises come from a Bigfoot. The eerie late-night serenade began in November and emanate from a brushy swamp. The cries range from high-pitched screams to basso profundo roars, screams and roars so loud and disturbing that they have apparently caused an uproar, according to the article, within the local community of 1,500 people. These strange sounds are enough to make men's hair stand on end when the shrieks commence. The location of these strange screams and roars is near the foothills of the Blue Mountains in a swampy canyon which borders the old reservation community of Mission right next door. Some tenants of the reservation's 190 rentals and 32 homes admitted being afraid 
and one man reported that his dogs were terrified to go outside, said Josh Franklin, the housing authority's interim director. According to another person's account, it's difficult to shrug off the accounts, said Marcus Luke, a housing authority home ownership counselor. Many on the reservation are woodsy type folk, familiar with animals and not prone to taking fright at nighttime commotion, he said. There are deeper tribal associations and beliefs in Bigfoot from some of the Umatilla tribe community members. Bigfoot is part of the tribal cultural tradition and spiritual beliefs, said Luke, a follower of the Wasat or Seven Drums, a religion, and a longhouse drummer and singer. We have stories about it, he said. Denise Minion, mother of Sylvia Marion, says there may be more than one creature out in the darkness of the swamp. She's heard shrieks from two directions at once, as if two animals were communicating. It was no noise I've ever heard before. Recent eyewitness observations of very large human-like footprints are also put forth. Armand Mintorn, Sylvia Mintorn's uncle, and tribal spiritual leaders said he may have stumbled onto evidence of Bigfoot's presence while hunting in the Blue Mountains many years ago. Right in the middle of the road was this great big footprint, perhaps 16 or 18 inches long and man-like, he said. The enormous stride carried it across the road, leaving one footprint in the middle, he said. That observation gives us a more current evaluation of this creature's incredibly long stride, the thing that legends are made of, from the Paiute stories of Nunumik to the Upper Skagit legend of Kalalitabik, whose length between each steps was so large that, legend told, it could cross the Cascade Mountains in a single stride. Incidentally, the findings of a very large man-like footprint near this area in the Blue Mountains region have also been noted by many other people in both Oregon and Washington State. The article mentions another individual's observation of similar prints having also been observed approximately 47 years before the 2013th newspaper articles. A Walla Walla cyclist named Pete Luther found 19-inch-long bear footprints in 1966 along Tiger Canyon Road east of Walla Walla on the Oregon-Washington border just north of the reservation. Paul Freeman, a U.S. Forest Service worker, has also found and actually cast these huge man-like footprints in the same Blue Mountains of Washington State. Some of the footprints he had cast in plaster contained dermal ridges, which is Bigfoot equivalent to fingerprints. Comments from several law enforcement agencies who've also examined the plaster cat footprints and seem more flabbergasted by the implications that it defies common logic to even consider. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!